We're now going to talk about forearm flexor muscles, and there's the learning objectives, but primarily we're going to look at these eight forearm flexor muscles and talk about their uh, actions and their innervations and end up by talking about the carpal tunnel. All right, so there are eight forearm flexor muscles divided into superficial, intermediate, and deep groups. We have four superficial, one intermediate, and three deep muscles. So let's take the superficial group first. And from those superficial, we'll start with the pronator teres. It gets its name because it pronates the forearm and its tubular, which is what teres mean. This muscle arises from the medial epicondyle, and it inserts laterally on the radius. So, um, uh, so it pronates the forearm. But another thing is you see this picture. The median nerve, as it comes over that super medial supracondylar ridge, it pierces through the belly of the pronator teres and then enters the forearm. So that's another significant thing about our pronator teres. And as this muscle... Uh, courses from medial epicondyle to radius and it contracts, it does that movement. Pronation, hence the name pronator teres. Now the next is the flexor carpi radialis muscle, FCR for short. It comes from the medial epicondyle and then, since it's on the anterior compartment, it's a flexor and it comes down to the carpus. It's the second and third, uh, base of the second and third metacarpal on the radial side, hence the name flexor carpi radialis muscle and this is going to flex the wrist. Next is our palmaris longus. It comes from the medial epicondyle and then attaches. This is a funny one. Well, not funny like Jerry Seinfeld, but, but interesting. And the, the palmaris longus, uh, it does not insert on a bone. It inserts on this uh, uh, palmar uh, aponeurosis we see highlighted there as it tenses in, um, in the hand. And not everyone has one of these muscles either. Well, there's our palmaris longus. And the flexor carpal naris comes from the medial epicondyle and then also goes down to the carpus. This is the pisiform and base of the fifth metacarpal. And this also flexes the wrist. Now, this is the only forearm flexor with the word ulna in it, ulnaris. It's the only forearm muscle, uh, well, not only. It's the one of the prime ones innervated by the ulnar nerve. Half of another muscle is as well. But if you're wondering what innervates uh, the flexor carpi ulnaris, remember... It's got ulna in it, so it's the ulnar nerve. All right, so the flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris muscles all flex the wrist in this fashion. There's flexion of the wrist. All right, now, there's our superficial muscles. So three of those are innervated by median nerve, and the one with the word ulna in it is innervated by ulnar nerve. So there's our superficial, halfway there. Now we're going to remove the superficial layer of uh, muscles and get them out of the way. And then the intermediate, there's only one. It's the flexor digitorum superficialis, or FDS. It arises from two heads, the medial epicondyle of the humerus, as well as the radius. And then those four tendons converge in the CT for carpal tunnel, and then they insert on the uh, distal, uh, into the fingers, pardon me, into the, the digits and the middle phalanges. So if we were to take a magnifying glass and close up, there we've got those two arrows show one tendon of the FDS, and then on that proximal phalange, it bifurcates to insert on two different elements of the middle phalange. And hence, the primary joint in the finger, so even though like this joint, this muscle, the FDS, crosses your wrist, so it'll flex the wrist, crosses the MCP, it'll flex that. The primary digit that it, that it uh, acts on is the proximal interphalangeal joint because it does not cross the DIP. So to actually isolate it from uh, the uh, flexor digitorum profundus, take three of the four digits, lesser digits. Um, the thumb is the great digit, but four, three of the four lesser digits and isolate them. So I've isolated my second, third, and fourth finger, and now when I contract the primary joint the primary uh, joint being acted upon is the PIP. In fact, if you were to take the pinky and wiggle it, it's really loose. We've taken away the biomechanical advantage by stretching out three muscles of the FDP. All right, so now let's remove this intermediate layer, uh, get rid of the FDS, and now we're in the last three, the deep layers. And so one of those is the flexor pollicis longus, and the name tells you what it does. It flexes, pollicis, whenever you see pollicis, think thumb. It arises from the radius, courses through the carpal tunnel, and inserts on the distal phalanx of your thumb, and it will flex your thumb. The next is the flexor digitorum profundus. This is one you're going to want to make note of because it's different. It arises from the ulna, courses down, 
and then traverses the carpal tunnel and inserts on digits 5, 4, 3, and 2 on the distal phalanges. But what makes it unique is its innervation, where the radial half of the FDP is innervated by the median nerve, which means, and then the ulnar half is innervated by the ulnar nerve. And so if we follow that dotted line, the median nerve innervates the part of the belly that acts on digits two and three, your index and square finger. And so here I'm bending the DIP joint. That DIP of digit two and of three is the median nerve innervation portion of the FDP. Now the ulnar belly is uh, going to then act upon digits four and five, the ring finger and pinky. So here, when bending the DIP joint, that is being uh, acted upon by the ulnar belly of the FDP. And so you can actually test the median and ulnar nerves by bending the DIP, the distal interphalangeal joint, for digits two and three for median and digits four and five for ulnar. So there we've got it. Now the FDS, flexor digitorum superficialis, and FDP, flexor digitorum profundus insertions, are like the Kardashian sisters. So there's Kim and there's Courtney. Actually, I'm not sure if I got the right ones or not, but go with me on this, okay? And a couple years ago, they were skiing in Park City. And Kim was skiing down the mountain and said, hey, Courtney, I've got an idea. And Courtney said, hey, what's that? Kim said, I got an idea. Let me ski through your legs. So Courtney then spread her legs apart and Kim skied through them. And then they biffed it, I think, and that's what got in the news, and they got pictures and stuff. So, Kim skied through Courtney's legs. So, the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle is Courtney. Because the FDS bifurcates, or spreads its legs to attach on the middle phalange. Then Kim is the FDA, FDP, because the flexor digitorum profundus skis through the legs of the FDS, and it inserts on the distal phalange. So that's one of the interesting things you can look at when we're in their cadaver lab. Finally is the pronator quadratus. This muscle pronates the forearm and it's four-sided quadratus shaped. And it goes from the ulna to the radius and when the muscle contracts, it pronates the forearm. So the forearm flexor muscles, here's the eight of them and they have common location, origin, action, and innervation. The common location, anterior forearm. If these muscles, when you see muscles on the anterior part of the forearm, or in other words, the tendons go to the palm of the hand, they're flexors. Common origin. Five of these eight arise from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Innervation. Most of them are innervated by the median nerve, except for the flexor carpi ulnaris and half of the flexor digitorum profundus. So heavy on the median nerve, a little bit on ulnar nerve. And finally, common action. Flexion, that's what they have in common. All right, and so we've been talking about the carpal tunnel. Let's do this uh, talk a little bit more detail. This is an anterior view of the hand on the right side, and you see this little crease at the distal part of the forearm. If you find that crease and you put a postage stamp sh uh, about the size of a postage stamp between the thenar and hypothenar eminences distal to that crease, that's the location of the carpal tunnel. And so if we now take a, a line cross-section through that area, we see now a cross-section of the carpal tunnel. Where in orange, those are the carpal bones. Notice how they make a concave surface, like a bowl. And then you put a lid on this bowl, it is this dense, regular collagenous connective tissue we call the flexor retinaculum. And between the flexor retinaculum and the carpal bones, there's the carpal tunnel. Now I want you to notice that those carpal bones, yeah, they're not gonna move a whole lot. They're pretty solid and they're anchored together. And the flexor retinaculum, it feels like a bone. It is so thick. So when pressure builds up in this carpal tunnel, there's not gonna be a lot of uh, stretching occur. So we're gonna just move a little bit more distal and take another cross section. And here we have the carpal tunnel. And so the contents of the carpal tunnel include four tendons from the flexor digitorum superficialis. And there are the four tendons because they go to digits, the lesser digits, digits two through five. And then you also have four tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus, or FDP, one, two, three, and four. And then we have one more tendon, and there's our flexor pollicis longus, going to the thumb. And so 
between the FDS, FDP, and FPL, that should say FPL, I'm sorry, that's a mistake, uh, flexor pollicis longus, there's our nine tendons. And then in blue, that's the synovial sheath, and that synovial sheath is what uh, wraps around these tendons, lubricating those tendons when they're moving back and forth. And if you look at your wrist when you move your fingers, you can see those tendons moving back and forth helps to stop um, friction from building up. But if they get inflamed, they can cause pressure. And then there's our median nerve. And so the contents of the carpal tunnel are nine tendons, a median nerve, and the synovial sheaths.